Please don't skip ahead yet. Hi, this is your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian, Josh LaRue. Just need a moment of your time. A lot of people don't know, but we're not able to monetize this channel here on YouTube due to the fact that the copyright holders of the books I narrate, the movies we riff, they get the ad revenue, and also being a partner on YouTube involves a lot of rules and censorship, and to do so would make it where a lot of the content, the audiobooks, the riffs, would have to be heavily censored or deleted completely. So we depend on amazing slashaholics like you to help fund the channel and keep it going and growing for years to come. And there's several fun ways to do that. You could join our Patreon right up there. And as a patron, you can join for as low as like $2, $5, $10 a month on up as high as you want and enjoy a lot of cool gifts like free ebooks, early access, exclusive content, even voicing characters and audiobooks here on the channel. You could also go to our PayPal and use the QR code right there and uh, you can donate directly to the channel. We see all donations and we appreciate all of them. If you don't want to use the QR code or don't know how, you can use our PayPal email address, which will be in the description below and the pinned comment, as well as our Cash App uh, donation username. And a fun way to help the channel is through our Cameo right down there. Uh, on Cameo, you can ask for a birthday video, anniversary video. You can ask us to sing a song or something or ask us questions. And you can get a video from me, Alex, Sean, Master Evil, Mother Evil, the Rodeo Clown, any character from any show on the channel, or any character that I've voiced in the audiobooks. It's a fun way to help the channel. It's only $10 a video. We'll have a lot of fun doing that. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoy tonight's content. Be excellent to each other. Please consider helping the channel. And always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. Thank you. Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers, the unofficial novelization by Jake Martin. Chapter 2 The following morning, Dr. Samuel Loomis found himself pacing anxiously along the dimly lit hallway of the Haddonfield Children's Clinic, dressed in his worn brown and tan suit. His brisk strides were accompanied by the rhythmic tap of his cane hitting the floor an unwanted trophy of the fateful night in 1978 that forever changed his life. The failed attempt to kill Michael Myers had left him with a permanent limp and a cane. The pain was still excruciating some days. Deep within his heart, Dr. Loomis carried a profound yearning, a deep-seated wish that the explosion he had triggered all those years ago had brought an end to not only Michael, but to himself as well. But fate had played a cruel joke, leaving him scarred and disfigured, forcing him to bear the burden of his failures for the rest of his life. The unsightly burn scars on his face mirrored the scars of his soul. As time passed, his traumatic experience took a toll on his physical appearance, prematurely aging him beyond his years. The lines on his face spoke of the wounds he carried deep within, each representing a failure, a regret, a haunting memory. The events of the previous Halloween had only exacerbated his torment. Despite being in his early 60s, the trauma of his past had aged him further, making him appear as if he were pushing 80. The pain and trauma had etched themselves onto his very being, leaving him with an air of weariness that couldn't be shaken off. The memories of the more recent killings of 1988 had haunted him every day since, and the pain in his leg jetted into Sam's mind. Thoughts of Michael's brutality, of being thrown through a glass window at Haddonfield Elementary. Each twinge of pain brought back visions of the horrors he had faced, evoking physical discomfort and resurrecting vivid memories and overwhelming anger. Dr. Loomis had always been known for his fiery temper, but it had transformed into a raging inferno of unbridled rage in recent months. Even the slightest discomfort or irritation could trigger an explosive outburst. His cane became a tool of intimidation, a means to exert control over those who dared to cross his path. If a staff member failed to meet his expectations, they would be subjected to his furious tirades or even a firm strike from his cane. 
The blows were never severe enough to inflict actual harm, of course, but they did serve as a clear warning that they had crossed a line. Even Jamie, the young girl under his care, had felt the sting of fear in his presence. Loomis wished she didn't fear him, but he couldn't blame her. Sam's mind was consumed by his obsession to uncover the truth behind Jamie's condition. The frustration of being unable to pinpoint the exact source of her troubles gnawed at him relentlessly. He had dedicated an immense amount of time and effort to understand just what the hell had been happening to her, but his endeavors had yielded no answers. However, his concern for Jamie remained constant. He genuinely feared for her well-being his apprehension deeply rooted in his disbelief that her struggles could be attributed solely to a conventional mental health issue. This was something different, something far more sinister. Medication alone couldn't provide the solution. Deep within, Dr. Loomis sensed Jamie was engaged in an internal battle he couldn't see. In recent months, the frequency and severity of Jamie's seizures had escalated, reaching an alarming level. The violent convulsion she had experienced the previous night had solidified Dr. Loomis's belief that a deeper pathology was at play, one that eluded the countless scans and tests conducted thus far. He sensed a vicious and elusive element within her brain activity, demanding his full attention. Driven by an insatiable need to unravel Jamie's mysteries, Dr. Loomis paced back and forth, his cane striking the floor with a resounding thud that was audible throughout the hospital ward. Each step he took brought him closer to a breakthrough, or so he hoped. Dr. Loomis approached his contemplation of Michael and Jamie with a deliberate pace, meticulously considering every aspect of their complex cases. He was a realist and a pragmatist, acknowledging the elusive nature of the absolute evil that confounded him for years. Yet he persisted in his relentless pursuit of understanding, refusing to let fear or doubt deter him. During his 15 years treating Michael Myers at Smith's Grove Sanitarium, Dr. Loomis had become a figure of fear among that staff. Their trepidation had grown to such an extent that, on the scheduled Wednesday visits when Loomis met with Michael, nearly half of the nursing staff would conveniently take the morning shift off, avoiding any encounters with the imposing doctor. Sam's nervous mannerisms and how he referred to Michael as an it, as if he were some dangerous, untamed beast, instilled extreme unease within the administrative staff. The higher-ups grew increasingly nervous about keeping Loomis as Michael's psychiatrist, leading to five administrative hearings over his period of care aimed at removing Michael from his care. Under ordinary circumstances, Dr. Loomis would employ his persuasive skills. He'd essentially wax philosophically about Michael until they couldn't take it anymore to sway the decision makers, ensuring Michael remained under his supervision. Although Loomis exasperated the doctors, they reluctantly acknowledged that no one understood Michael's case as profoundly as he did. However, they concealed their agreement, fearing the consequences of provoking Loomis further. Despite Dr. Loomis's persistent efforts to be heard, his words fell upon deaf ears. The staff at Smith's Grove held a deep-seated disdain for the doctor, fueling their dismissal and fear of his claims. Even the skeptical medical board overseeing Loomis's methods questioned the validity of his assertions, casting doubt on his credibility. But it was Michael's own parents who remained the most resistant to Loomis's unsettling conclusions. They clung stubbornly to the belief that their son was nothing more than a normal, albeit troubled, kid, choosing to deny the horrifying reality that their own flesh and blood had brutally taken their daughter's life. Loomis believed Michael's parents' claims of normal upbringing were genuine. However, in the wake of Judith's murder, he saw beyond the facade of Michael's parents, perceiving their innocence and sincerity in claiming a seemingly ordinary upbringing for their son. Judith, Michael's sister, had once embodied promise and potential, shining as an exceptional student with a future brimming with possibilities. Delving into Michael's younger sister, Lori Strode's confidential background, Loomis discovered no traces of mental illness, 
finding her trajectory equally bright. It appeared that both siblings were on a path towards success and happiness. That is, of course, until the cataclysmic events of Judith's murder in 1963 and the traumatic events of 1978, shattering Lori's life forever. Inexplicably, the lone outlier of the family, Michael, had become a cold-blooded, unstoppable killer, a psychopath consumed by pure evil. The administrative staff at Smith's Grove remained steadfast in their belief that Michael was nothing more than a catatonic, incapable of causing harm. Disregarding Loomis's vehement protest and testimony, they dismissed his cause for transferring Michael to maximum security. And after his escape and massacre in 1978, Loomis almost lost his mind when they relocated him to a minimum security medical prison in Richmond during his comatose period after the Inferno. Once again, they should have heeded Loomis's warnings, for Michael escaped, leaving body after body in his wake. Sheriff Brackett of the Haddonfield Police Department was the only one who had partially embraced Loomis's belief in Michael's inherent evil. However, even he had harbored doubts until he witnessed the shredded corpse of a dog Michael had been feasting on in his childhood home, and the murder of his very daughter that night. Following the murders of 1988 and the attack on Jamie Lloyd, the world began to awaken to Loomis's words, slowly accepting the unfathomable darkness lurking within Michael. But to Loomis, it was all too little, all too late. If only Smith's Grove had heeded his warnings from the beginning, if only they had cared enough to act, perhaps the nightmare could have been prevented. Amid the relentless pacing, the striking of the cane reverberated through the hospital ward, and Dr. Loomis's mind raced with a sense of urgency. Jamie's condition had escalated, her seizures becoming increasingly frequent and severe. Last night's violent convulsions was a chilling indication of a deeper pathology at play, eluding all the scans and tests conducted thus far. It was as if an elusive and insidious force was manipulating her brain. With each stride, he could feel the responsibility on his shoulders, bearing down on him. Dr. Loomis was acutely aware of the fear he instilled in the hospital staff. They viewed him with suspicion and unease. Even after everything, they whispered behind his back and avoided his presence whenever possible. His intense focus and determination had rendered him an enigmatic figure, an embodiment of the horrors he had witnessed and the relentless pursuit of justice that consumed him. But Dr. Loomis refused to allow their discomfort to deter him. He knew that the key to unlocking the secrets of Jamie's condition lay within her consciousness. He needed to speak with her, to delve into the depths of her mind and unearth the hidden truths that could sever the tenuous connections she shared with Michael. Although unconventional and deemed unacceptable by the medical community, Sam's theory whispered to him in the darkest recesses of his thoughts. It was the idea that when Jamie had touched Michael's arm just before his descent into the infernal pit, a fragment of Michael's malevolence had passed into her. It was an unorthodox hypothesis, required massive leaps in logic, and risked his medical license if spoken aloud. Yet deep within his being, he believed there was more at work here than mere coincidence. He had witnessed Jamie's sudden transformation, a gentle and loving child turned into a vessel of violence. The inexplicable attack on her foster mother, followed by her lack of any recollection, gnawed at his conscience. The nightmares and seizures that intensified as the anniversary of Michael's rampage approached only served to reinforce his conviction. An invisible thread connected Jamie and Michael, a connection that defied logic and medical explanations. Dr. Loomis's contemplative steps quickened, driven by a relentless pursuit of answers. He knew that time was slipping away, that the longer he delayed, the more treacherous the situation would become. Lives hung in the balance, and he needed to decipher the enigma that entangled Jamie's mind. Dr. Loomis was a man haunted by his past failures and tormented by the atrocities committed by Michael Myers. But he clung to hope, 
a glimmer of light in the encroaching darkness. He would confront the unspeakable evil that lurked within Jamie, face it head on, and in doing so, perhaps exercise the demons that had plagued his soul. Rachel Carruthers was sleeping. She was uncomfortably sitting on a chair with her head resting on Jamie's bed. She arrived at the Haddonfield Children's Hospital just before midnight. Rachel was woken up from a restful sleep the previous evening after receiving a call from the medical staff at the hospital. She was told that Jamie had had her worst seizure to date. If that wasn't enough to give Rachel a good dose of panic-induced anxiety... She was then told that Dr. Hart had almost cut open her throat before Dr. Loomis intervened. Rachel had bordered on the idea of suing the bastard. Rachel couldn't stay mad for long as worry completely overtook her mind. Rachel couldn't imagine not being there for Jamie when she woke in the morning. So she elected to spend the night at the hospital with no cots available. Rachel had no choice but to sleep on an uncomfortable and squeaky office chair. Baggy-eyed with tear-streaked mascara, Rachel woke to Jamie brushing her curly blonde hair back under her left ear. Hey there, funny face, Rachel said cheerfully as she rubbed her eyes. Jamie smiled and laughed, but no sound emanated from her mouth. Rachel hoped above all hope that one day Jamie would wake up and start talking like it was no big thing. But still, she couldn't or wouldn't speak. Jamie used to talk and ask so many questions about everything and anything that sometimes Rachel wished she would just shut the hell up. Now she wanted nothing more than to have Jamie scream questions at her. Sam told Rachel a few months back that the only explanation was a residual shock after last Halloween. Sam thought her voice would return in time, but it was unlikely to rise above whispers. So week after week, she hoped... But the only change was just as Sam had said, just little whispers on occasion. Jamie pointed to Rachel's smudged mascara. What? Oh, thank you. Rachel cleared her eyes with her finger. The two stared at each other for a minute, incensed but did not say what they were thinking a year ago. They faced an absolute evil and almost lost their lives in the process. That they were incredibly thankful for being here today, together and very much alive. Survivor's guilt is a bitch, though. Rachel lost her boyfriend and the family dog, and her mother was almost stabbed to death by the little girl in front of her. Neither Jamie nor Rachel had moved on. They were both, in a way, stuck in the past, stuck in that night. The depression alone was turning Rachel into a kind of semi-reclusive bitch. Sure, she had friends, but when she would hang out with them, Rachel wasn't really there, and when she was, she was temperamental, to say the least. Her mind was still back on that cold, dark night a year ago. Rachel and Jamie's loving stare was broken when a huge Doberman lunged powerfully at the window behind Jamie's bed, barking loudly. <laughs> the dog's wet paws were dirtying up the window glass. With no more than a whisper, Jamie exclaimed, Max! But all that came out was air and no sound, as if her vocal cords were severed entirely, leaving nothing but air pressure escaping her lungs. Tina Williams, Rachel's best friend, who essentially amounted to being a second sister to Jamie, pressed her head to the glass next to Max. Tina growled through the window, Let me in! In her excitement, Jamie turned around and sat on her knees on the bed, facing the window, and opened it as fast as she could. Fresh air filled the room, and Max flew in and fell to the floor. His legs splayed. Max picked himself up and jumped on the bed. He eagerly began licking Jamie's face clean, slobber and all. Tina climbed through the window next, and like Max, she fell to the floor. Tina began to laugh hysterically. Rachel had a notion that Tina had already started drinking, and it was only ten in the morning. Something colorful was behind Tina's back, and Jamie was curious. 
Once Tina was up off the floor, Jamie wrapped her arms around Tina and began to search around Tina's very stylish leather bomber jacket. I wonder what Rachel is hiding behind door number two. Tina had slyly passed the mystery item over to Rachel, while Jamie was trying to find it on Tina. Tina began to dance in front of Rachel, getting ready for the big reveal and then turned to the side, revealing a beautiful pink princess costume dress for Jamie. Jamie uttered loud whisper noises that indicated excitement and hand sign, Is this for me? Who else would it be for? Rachel said. Tina giggled and said, Looks like Billy is going to have to fight a lot of the other boys off for your attention, Jamie. Amidst the commotion caused by Max, Tina, Rachel, and Jamie, a deep, gravelly voice pierced through the noise. Dr. Sam Loomis stood sternly at the entrance to Jamie's room. His fatigue was apparent, and he was clearly not in the mood for these young ladies' silliness. Asserting his authority, he sternly stated, What is going on in here? Dogs are not allowed here. Remove it from this hospital now. Please and thank you, young Miss Williams. Tina turned to look at Sam with disdain, considered giving him the finger, and then turned back to Jamie and rolled her eyes. Sorry, Jamie. She leashed up Max and said, Bye, Jamie. I'll see you tonight. Tina and Max left the way they came in, through the window. Tina hit the ground outside the window with a seemingly painful thump, followed by a yelp of pain from Tina on the other side. Rachel looked out the window and yelled, didn't break anything, did you? Only my pride, Rach, but that's nothing new, Tina laughed. I'll meet you at my place here in a few, Rachel shouted down. I kind of want something sweet, Mr. Frosty's? Rachel gave Tina a thumbs up. Sounds good to me. Tina began singing to herself and walked into the park behind the hospital with Max. Rachel turned towards Jamie, knelt to Jamie's level, and softly said to her, I'll be back tomorrow afternoon, okay? I spoke with Mom and Dad, and they sent their love. I knew you'd want to see them, but remember that they had to leave town for a few weeks for Uncle Harry's funeral in Chicago. You didn't know Uncle Harry, but Mom was very close with him. Remember those hour-long phone calls they used to have? So this time, I can't blame her for not coming here to be with you today. And I am so sorry I won't be able to come tonight. I want to see you in your princess costume so badly, Jamie, but I promise to help at the tower farm. Jamie's mood went from exuberantly happy to visibly pissed off when she heard that. Jamie turned her head away from Rachel, and tears began to roll down her cheeks. Oh, Jamie, I know you wanted me here tonight. This isn't an excuse, but my therapist said it would be really good for me to do something for myself. And Tina told me they needed help setting up the party, so I couldn't say no. Jamie refused to move and began to cry. Oh, Jamie, please look at me. Rachel leaned over and put her hand on Jamie's shoulder. She wanted to make this right, but she didn't think she could right now. Rachel closed her eyes and kissed the top of Jamie's head. Jamie frowned and dropped a few more silent tears. Since she had been admitted to the Haddonfield Children's Clinic, Jamie had begun to think that her foster parents hated her. Sure, Richard had come almost once a month since her admission to the hospital, but not this month. Considering the funeral, she knew better than to think that he would come this month. But she knew that he could have come earlier at some point this month as well. Darlene was another story entirely. She hadn't come, but for a solitary time, and Jamie blamed herself for Darlene's apparent avoidance. Jamie just wished Richard would stop telling her they were still a family and that they loved her when she knew better. Jamie didn't want hope. She wanted to know what her reality was, but she wanted to live with Rachel when she moved to college next year. Rachel said she might adopt her after all, and Rachel had never lied to her. Rachel said it would be great if Jamie went with her to Chicago for college. They could get a small apartment. Rachel would go to class and work part-time. Jamie would go to a good school in a bigger, more exciting city, away from all of this, and they would be happy. 
Jamie hoped she'd be out of the hospital soon and in a real home with her sister. Right now, though, Rachel wanted to party at the Tower Farm. She knew how difficult this time would probably be, so why would she not be here for Jamie? Teenagers and grown-ups were hard to understand. Rachel said, I love you, again. Jamie didn't respond. Rachel got off the bed and grabbed her purse, hanging on the back of the chair that she had slept on. She gave Jamie one more look and began to leave the room. Suddenly, the window that Tina and Max had just climbed through was smashed open, startling everyone. They watched as a rock was thrown through the window, scattering shards of glass everywhere. Rachel instinctively jumped on Jamie's bed and held the frightened girl in her arms, protecting her from the hell of glass. One of the jagged pieces of glass embedded itself in Rachel's forearm, and she emitted a brief but startled cry, more of shock than of pain. The rock hit the floor, skidded across the tiles, and landed in front of Sam's feet. Slowly, Jamie and Rachel turned their gaze upward, their eyes meeting Sam's stern countenance as he picked up the rock. Attached to the stone with a rubber band, a folded piece of notebook paper awaited its unveiling. Sam carefully removed the band and gingerly unfolded the paper, revealing its contents. Bold black marker strokes forming a written message. The evil child must die. Dr. Loomis's gaze bore into Rachel with a stern gravity, conveying an unspoken message that resonated within her. The realization struck her like a lightning bolt. This was no mere prank. The rock hurtling through the shattered window had been intentionally launched to frighten and intimidate Jamie. Sensing Jamie's curiosity and concern, Rachel turned her attention to her sister. Jamie's hands moved fluidly in sign language, seeking answers to the pressing question that hung in the air. What does it say? Her eyes, a mix of trepidation and anticipation, fixated on Rachel, craving that explanation. Sam, his expression lined with caution, observed the interaction between the two sisters. He recognized the significance of this moment, watching Rachel deal with the fragile balance between protecting Jamie and revealing certain truths to her. Pausing briefly to gather his thoughts, he realized he was on a tightrope. This sweet, innocent little girl had already received enough trauma. Should he dare pile more on top of her? Should he continue this pursuit and, in doing so, damage Jamie so far beyond repair that she could become a permanent resident of the psych ward? Nothing, sweetheart. It's okay. Let's get you moving for the day, Rachel said. Rachel looked around at the glass-covered floor and said, Maybe we should clean this mess up first. After cleaning up, Sam and Rachel got Jamie ready for her day and set her up for breakfast in the cafeteria. Before leaving Jamie at her table, Rachel said, Jamie, let me say sorry again, okay? I really am. When I get back, I promise a thousand times over that I'll come take you for a weekend with me, just us two, okay? Jamie's silence spoke volumes. Her shrugged response, a poignant expression of resignation. She avoided making eye contact with Rachel, withdrawing into her thoughts and emotions. Sensing her defeat, Rachel reluctantly left Jamie to her mill, her heart heavy with guilt for not staying by her side during this tumultuous time. Accompanied by Sam, she followed him towards the front door of the hospital, the broken glass and rock still lingering heavily in her mind. As they stepped outside into the embrace of the late October sun, an unexpected warmth permeated the air, defying the usual chill of the season. Sunbeams caressed Rachel's face, momentarily soothing her troubled mind. Seeking respite from the sun's glare, she retrieved a pair of sunglasses from her purse and gently placed them on her face, shielding her eyes from the brilliance surrounding them. Now removed from the confines of the hospital and beyond the reach of Jamie's ears, Sam and Rachel found a moment of privacy to talk about the reality of the situation. Dr. Loomis, I'm feeling selfish for leaving her right now, especially after what just happened, Rachel said, staring shamefully at the ground. 
There would be very little that you could do if you stayed, replied Sam. Besides, you could use some time to, well, how do you girls put it? Let your hair down? Rachel chuckled at Sam's attempt to understand young women momentarily and said, I know, Dr. Loomis, but someone should be with her. She's surrounded by hospital staff, sure, and that's fine and dandy, but she needs a family. You know, she needs a family. And to be honest, Doctor, I, I think I'm all she's got left. You would be surprised at how close Jamie and I have become this past year, Sam said, and Rachel winced at this notion, but she didn't know quite why. I will keep my eye on her. My good eye, that is. Sam guided his hand towards his left eye. His cloudy and dark right eye was the victim of a bad cataract. Having developed a familiarity with Sam for the past year, Rachel had grown accustomed to his distinctive appearance. Their weekly encounters had forged a bond, gradually desensitizing her to the burn scars that marred the right side of Sam's face. To her, he was no longer defined by his disfigurement. Instead, she saw him simply as another human being. The scars had become an accepted part of his identity, blending into the tapestry of his character. On the other hand, Tina was still very much creeped out by Sam Loomis. Not just because of his face, it was his demeanor that got to her. Spooky Sam was the moniker that Tina would occasionally use to describe the good Dr. Loomis. I hear you, Dr. Loomis, I do. But look at what just happened. People in this town still blame her, a little girl, for what happened last year. How it got out that Michael Myers and Jamie are related, I don't know. But if I find out who let that nugget of information out, I swear to God, I'll stab them myself. Sam looked at Rachel with an almost hypnotic stare. Rachel, listen to me. No one told anyone about that. I believe the public deduced it after Jamie did what she did. They don't know the specifics, thank Christ. But nonetheless, we are living in a small town. It is widely assumed that people know things about everyone in a small town. The assumption isn't wrong. Rachel took a moment before asking her next question. She fished out a lighter and a pack of kints from her purse took a cigarette from the pack and lit it, taking a long, satisfying drag. She hadn't always smoked, not until recently anyway. Stress had gotten to her in ways she didn't think was possible. The smokes helped. The smell of burning tobacco mingled with the crisp autumn air as she brought the lit cigarette to her lips for a second drag. Rachel stared at the flower bed in the entryway of the hospital. You aren't fully convinced she isn't like him, are you? Are you? Loomis retorted almost instantly. Rachel looked away from Sam's gaze, ashamed about her internal feelings about Jamie, which had steadily worsened over the last year. She knew she shouldn't think for two seconds that Jamie was like Michael. But why did she stab her mother then? Why is she now institutionalized like her uncle was? Why won't she speak? These were just a few critical questions that had been burning in Rachel's head for the last 365 long days. Some pieces weren't adding up. And yes, she had thought for a moment that maybe Jamie wasn't exactly an ordinary little girl now. That something changed in her. That maybe one day she'll not only be mute, but completely joyless, empty, and then... No, she couldn't finish her thoughts. It hurt her to even think about it, let alone say it. If you stay, Loomis continued, you will only increase her ability to sense your doubts in her. She's a smart, deductive girl, Rachel. Take it from an old man. Go live while you can, Rachel. Time flies when you're young. I will be here for Jamie. She will be safe. You have my word. Still unconvinced she was making the right decision about tonight, Rachel resigned to meet up with Tina and get this party underway. She was still very nervous for Jamie, but felt a little better and appreciated the old man's kind words of wisdom. 
Dr. Loomis turned and looked at the front doors of the hospital. He had thoughts of evil in his mind. There was somewhere very important he needed to be. Chapter 3 Rachel and her dog, Max, were hanging out with Tina at the Mr. Frosty ice cream parlor in downtown Haddonfield. They were sitting at a table having ice cream sundaes, and Tina could not for the life of her shut up about Mikey, her third boyfriend this year. It was an incessant drone that was really starting to piss Rachel off, especially considering that Rachel got little to no sleep the evening before. And what sleep she did get was highly uncomfortable, as she was sitting down on a chair with her face planted in a hospital bed. Alas, Rachel had always been the good friend. She was always as attentive and energetic as she could be when it came to whatever Tina was prattling on about. But she could be harsh when she wanted to be, cold even, especially this last year. There had been a few times where Tina thought Rachel and her were done for as friends, but Rachel had always called to apologize for being short with her. Tina had understood what both Rachel and Jamie had been through and had given them time and space, which Rachel had always greatly appreciated. Today was a mixed bag of feelings. Rachel was excited to do something fun for a change, but was incredibly upset at the idea of leaving Jamie behind. A year to the day since the terror they had faced, and she was going off to a party. Her conversation with Dr. Loomis had helped ease Rachel into the idea to go, and she really did want to. But Tina, who was sitting in front of her, babbling about Mikey at top volume, was giving Rachel a headache from hell. And then he totally blew me off like I was some kind of a fucking dime store hooker. I just don't know, Rachel. Mikey is cute and all, but, but Jesus tap dancing Christ, he can be a major fucking asshole. Maybe I should just call off this whole plan of me going out with him to the Tower Farm party and call it a fucking day. Fuck! I fucking should, shouldn't I? You know what? When we get to your place, I'll call him up and tell him to go fuck. Rachel had had enough. She bent over the table and put her hand over Tina's mouth. Slow down, Tina. Let a girl get up to speed here. You know you're talking a mile a minute, right? Rapid fire speed? And has anyone ever told you that you cuss too much? I mean, I'm no saint here, but Jesus, Tina, that was a lot of fucks. Rachel was now at her breaking point, and she could feel the vein in her forehead ready to pop. Goody Two-Shoes was falling to the wayside, and if Tina didn't take the hint, she was going to go into full bitch mode. Tina looked guilty and replied, Oh, honey, I'm sorry. Rachel, look, I know you're going through a lot right now, I mean, what with, well, I don't really need to say it, but look, you said it yourself that the doc told you to go have fun before you can't anymore, and I know that you've got a lot to go and do. Getting the party ready to rock and roll is a big project, so how about this? I don't call Mikey and tell him what I was gonna so eloquently tell him to do, and instead I give you my word that I will check on Jamie tonight myself and report back to you. I'll guarantee you that Jamie is going to have a totally amazing fucking time at her party. Then tomorrow, when you get back from your totally awesome party, you two can share how much fun you both had. You, of course, will leave out all of what I am sure will be raunchy parts. Rachel laughed big at this. The feeling that it was okay to laugh was spectacular. She felt positive about her decision now, almost euphoric. It would be okay. It would all be just fine and work out. They would both have a blast tonight, and then they would see each other tomorrow. Rachel might be a little hungover in the morning, but it would be okay. They finished up their floats and gave the remnants to Max, who lapped them up approvingly and greedily and walked back to Rachel's place. One good thing about Haddonfield was that the town was small enough to walk from one end to the other in about an hour and a half. The weather was amazing. 
The news had said earlier that day that the high would be somewhere in the mid-60s, unseasonably warm for late October, and the walk was a huge stress reliever for Rachel. The two young women walked up the driveway of Rachel's house. An obnoxiously loud engine roared from behind them. They turned around to see Mikey rolling up the side of the road in his jet-black 67 Camaro convertible, which sent Max into a fit of barking, and Rachel had to hold on to the leash for dear life. Baby! Mikey yelled to Tina. Tina looked solemnly at Rachel and said, I'm sorry, hon, but the man has a hold on me. I got a jet right now, but I'll call you later, okay? Rachel looked at the ground, lightly kicked it pretending to be miffed, and said, Ah, uh, it's okay. No big thing. I could use a little alone time for a shower and a nap anyway. I'll meet you at the tower farm. I gotta head there in about two hours to help them get ready, so I'll see you when you get out there? Tina ran to Mikey in his Camaro, jumped in, and landed her head on his lap. Mikey looked down at his girlfriend, and they locked lips for what Rachel thought must have been hours. Jesus, they are hot for each other. I wonder if they'll come up for air, Rachel thought, laughing to herself. Still snickering, Rachel turned and led Max inside her two-story family home. Seeing as Darlene and Richard were in Chicago, she had the whole place to herself and Max. She put the key and the deadbolt in the door. It had already been unlocked. Did I forget to deadbolt the door? As she entered the bathroom, Rachel wasted no time in starting the shower. The sound of rushing water drowning out the suffocating stillness that had enveloped the house. Wanting badly to break free from the oppressive silence, she craved the comforting embrace of music. And not just any music would do. She needed the raw power and cathartic release that only heavy metal could provide. Stepping into her bedroom adjacent to the bathroom, Rachel's eyes scanned the record box filled with tapes that she kept next to her dresser. She picked out the newly released Alice Cooper album Trash, which had hit the shelves back in July. Its vibrant cover art beckoned to her. She eagerly plucked the cassette from its case and swiftly inserted it into her trusted Casio boombox. She hit play and stepped into the shower. The room was suddenly engulfed in the blistering guitar riffs and thunderous beats that blared from the speakers. The melodic chaos of Alice Cooper's music blasted through the walls, drowning out any lingering traces of silence and replacing them with visceral energy. It was a paradoxical juxtaposition. For anyone observing Rachel purely based on appearances would never suspect her penchant for such intense and abrasive tunes. Yet here she was immersing herself in the fiery catharsis of heavy metal, finding comfort in its unapologetic expression. As the water cascaded down her naked body in rhythm with the pounding music, Rachel let herself be carried away by the savage melodies and searing lyrics. The turbulent storm of emotions that had been brewing within her since the horrifying incident of the previous year had now found release in the music. It was a sanctuary that allowed her to temporarily forget the haunting memories that lurked in the recesses of her mind. Hidden within the dense foliage of the tree line, the shape patiently observed the scene unfolding across the street from the hospital. His piercing gaze fixated on the boy, consumed by seething jealousy as he callously hurled a rock through the girl's window. That girl belonged to him, and this audacious interloper would not be allowed to impede his desires. With calculated precision, the shape commenced his methodical approach toward the boy, a predator closing in on his unsuspecting prey. Silent as a specter, he trailed the child, shadowing his every move, an invisible force of nature. Step by step, 
the shape ensured that no conceivable witness could thwart his dark intentions. Even if someone tried, they would be met with the same fate as this boy. Eventually, the boy sought refuge within an equipment shed nestled discreetly behind the hospital's sprawling grounds. Crouched low, his attention fixed on the broken window. The boy anticipated the sound of terrified screams, a sinister smile creeping across his face, reveling in his mischief. Unbeknownst to him, the towering monstrosity behind him remained hidden from his senses, oblivious to the imminent danger lurking mere inches away. The boy concluded his voyeuristic session, rising from his hiding place to exit. As he turned around, fate conspired against him and he collided with the shape's mammoth figure, toppling forcefully onto the earthen floor. Gazing upward, his widened eyes met the horrifying sight of the monster before him, brandishing an ominously large kitchen knife. Panic engulfed his mind, triggering a cascade of alarm bells within his brain. Pleading for mercy, the boy mustered his trembling voice, hoping to appeal to the masked monster's humanity. Yet the shape found amusement in this feeble attempt, his head swaying side to side in a sick gesture of dismissal. The shape began his relentless advance upon the boy. Each deliberate step was the sound of impending doom. The child's pleas transformed into anguished screams of despair, which fell upon deaf ears. At that moment, the boy realized the bitter truth. There was nowhere to flee and no one to rescue him from this nightmarish ordeal. His cries for help served only to invigorate the shape fueling the sadistic thrill that coursed through its veins, solidifying its reign of terror. With an unsettling intensity, the shape stooped down, his towering figure dominating the boy's fragile form. A surge of malevolence coursed through his veins as he violently seized the boy's right arm, hoisting him into the air with a single monstrous hand. Suspended helplessly, the boy became a pitiful marionette in the shape's sadistic play. Peering into the child's terror-stricken eyes, the shape reveled in the raw emotion on display. Tears streamed down the boy's face, intermingling with the sweat of his escalating panic. Each sob and shriek only fueled the shape's insatiable thirst for dominance. In a futile attempt at self-defense, the boy thrashed his legs, launching desperate kicks at his assailant. But his feeble resistance only magnified his plight's sheer hopelessness. Unperturbed by the boy's futile struggle, the shape tightened his grip on the child's arm, his fingers like iron vices. In one swift, brutal motion, he contorted the adolescent's limb with ruthless efficiency, snapping it like a fragile chicken wing. The boy's anguished howls filled the air, reverberating with the intensity of his torment. The excruciating and unremitting pain etched itself upon his features as he writhed in agony. Callously, the shape cast the boy aside, his monstrous strength propelling him forcefully to the ground. The impact shattered the delicate architecture of the boy's shoulder blade, causing him to convulse in sheer agony. Clutching his broken arm with a trembling hand, the boy cradled his shattered limb, futilely attempting to alleviate the unbearable pain that consumed him. Surveying the desolate surroundings of the equipment shed, the shape's eyes fixated on a dormant lawnmower tucked away in a corner an innocent object about to be transformed into an instrument of horror. With chilling resolve, he relinquished his knife, dropping it carelessly to the ground and embarked on a deliberate path toward the ominous machinery. As the boy's gaze flitted between hopelessness and confusion, the shape watched the despair envelop him, relishing in the powerlessness that washed over his broken spirit. With a sinister grasp, the shape's elongated appendages snatched hold of the lawnmower, hoisting it triumphantly into the air. Its grotesque form loomed over the defenseless boy, sprawled out on the shed's cold, unforgiving dirt floor. Fear and agony contorted the child's face as he writhed, screaming his lungs out for help. There would be no help. 
The shape brandished the lawnmower, its weight threatening to escape its inhuman grip. An unsettling stillness settled upon the shed, as if the air was holding its breath. The shape's attention focused on the boy, relishing the terror that would befall him. Time seemed to crawl as the child's wide, disbelieving eyes met the menacing gaze of the rusty blades nestled beneath the machine. The rough metal edges tainted a rusty green from years of usage stared back at him. Every serrated tooth harbored the potential to rend flesh and shatter bones. As the shape held the lawnmower above him, a silent plea within the boy's mind continued to ring, hope for salvation from the unthinkable fate that loomed overhead. Yet in the depths of his despair, he couldn't tear his eyes away, compelled to bear witness to the dark fate that had befallen him. At that moment, the boy's existence hung by a thread, suspended between the innocence of his past and the cruel, insane reality of the present moment. With potent force, the unholy monster thrust the weighty lawnmower onto the boy's defenseless abdomen. The sickening impact shattered the child's fragile frame, breaking several of his delicate ribs like brittle twigs. An excruciating pain and terror gripped his entire being, leaving him momentarily paralyzed in disbelief. The shape, its sinister intentions unabated, seized the lawnmower's starter rope in a frenzy, yanking it haphazardly to ignite the motor. The mower blades lurched to life for a fleeting moment, the rusty edges sinking into the boy's exposed stomach, mercilessly carving their way through tender flesh. To the boy's twisted horror, the engine failed to sustain its furious combustion. In a gruesome twist of fate, two razor-sharp blades became ensnared beneath the shattered remains of the child's ribcage, each insidious tooth gnawing at his flesh. Agony consumed his every fiber, a torment stretching into eternity. The boy's anguished cries now transformed into choked sobs, gasping for breath in the sea of unimaginable suffering. The shape, driven by an insatiable hunger for carnage, pulled the starter rope once more. A medley of metal and machinery erupted as the lawnmower roared to life, its blades spinning with reckless abandon. The mechanical whirring reached a crescendo, drowning out the boy's haunting cries as the relentless machine tore through his vulnerable midsection with sadistic precision. Innocent blood, vibrant and crimson, splattered and pulled across the floor of the equipment shed. The boy, caught in a nightmarish realm between life and death, discovered an unfathomable realm of agony that defied the boundaries of human endurance. The swirling and relentless vortex of pain pushed him to the precipice of sanity. In the cranking noises of grinding metal and the sickening squelch of flesh being rendered to mincemeat, the boy managed to summon one final act of defiance. A primal scream, born from the depths of his ravaged soul, tore through the air, a desolate plea for mercy in the face of unspeakable horror. But the unrelenting, swirling lawnmower blades ripped through his weak lungs, severing his voice and extinguishing his life, leaving behind only echoes of his final tortured wells. The shape let the mower handle go, and there was silence, peace even. He turned to leave the equipment shed and briefly looked back at his work, at his art. Leaders of the child's thick blood soaked the sawdust on the shed's floor, and streaks fell from the walls. The boy was eviscerated. His midsection, for lack of a better term, was gone. Michael Meyer shut the door to the shed and walked among the trees, using the foliage as cover as he continued back to his earlier vantage point. He stood outside, far enough away from the entrance to the hospital to see, yet not be seen. He saw the woman that hit him badly with the truck last year, and his blood intensified with rage. What made it worse was that the man, who haunted his very coherent thoughts, was standing beside her. Dr. Loomis. Michael's fury knew no limits, but he must contain himself at this juncture. It was too soon to make a move on these people. Or they would be mad. Sure, they let him have his fun, but they always had the last say. These people could be dealt with later. He needed to follow them, find their plans, 
and trap them. As the water cascaded over Rachel in the shower, the melodies of the Alice Cooper album filled the bathroom. However, her ears merely registered the faint background noise as her mind drifted to another realm plagued by memories that refused to fade. She envisioned a mask that seemed crafted from delicate porcelain, its ghostly visage etched into her consciousness. It conjured an image of a wickedly sharp kitchen knife mercilessly piercing the tender flesh of her upper arm. The floodgates of her recollections burst open, and Rachel's mind raced through a tumultuous labyrinth of fragmented memories. She saw Jamie, her sweet little stepsister, her innocent face etched with terror as she ran and screamed for salvation in the enveloping darkness. She saw pumpkins transformed into leering jack-o'-lanterns, casting their eerie glow in the skeleton costumes that adorned the bodies of trick-or-treaters. But the image of Jamie persisted, insidiously intertwining with her thoughts. This time, Jamie wore a blood-soaked clown costume, an ominous figure standing at the apex of a stairwell, brandishing gleaming scissors in her right hand. The figure was devoid of emotion, an embodiment of emptiness and lethality. Rachel's mind continued its wayward journey, traversing a landscape fraught with turbulent encounters. She remembered visiting Jamie in the sterile confines of the hospital, and the heartbreaking discussion with her mother about the uncertain future that awaited Jamie within their family. She recalled tense arguments filled with frustration and despair as they debated adoption arrangements with social services. Her thoughts spiraled in a chaotic dance, revolving relentlessly around Jamie's presence. A ghastly image materialized in Rachel's mind, one she immediately dismissed with a forceful mental push. It was a vision of Jamie. She was lifeless, peacefully lying within the confines of a funeral casket, forever separated from the world of the living. She banished that horrifying thought to the furthest corners of her consciousness, struggling to ground herself back in reality. <coughs> The abrupt barking of Max, their loyal canine companion, sounded through the house, jolting Rachel from her contemplative stupor. Startled, her heart pounded in her chest and she nearly leaped out of her skin at the unexpected sounds. Max! Rachel hollered with urgency, a mixture of alarm and concern. What's wrong? She called out, her voice betraying her anxiety. She waited for a response, but the dog kept barking. Rachel turned off the shower, grabbed a towel from the rack on the bathroom wall, and quickly dried off. Wrapping the towel around her, Rachel went downstairs, water still dripping from her curly blonde hair. Max was barking the whole time. She followed the barking and found Max in the kitchen. Max was not just barking, but growling in between. He was looking out of the screen door, leading to the backyard. Rachel felt that whatever was out there wasn't friendly and she was starting to get nervous. Max, Rachel said in a disapproving yet cautious voice. She grabbed Max's collar, pulling him back from the door, out of the kitchen and into the living room. She set the big dog down on the couch and pulled him close into a hug, slowly petting him to ease his fast-breathing pattern. Rachel felt his heart running wild. What did you see, boy? Rachel asked. Max whined quietly and gently put his head down on Rachel's lap. They sat like that for a few minutes before Rachel moved his head off her lap and said, I gotta get dressed, Max. Now sit on this couch and don't move. No more barking. Rachel went back upstairs. Max began to bark again before she even had a moment to get dressed. Jesus Christ, Max! Rachel muffled to herself and went back downstairs. Before she could get her eye on Max, the phone began to ring.
Jamie was playing in the art room with some of the other kids at the hospital. Tables covered in protective lining paper were lined up and down the large room. It was painting day, one of Jamie's favorites. Billy Hill, an orphan from out of state with a bad stutter who had a rather sizable crush on Jamie, under pain of death she'd never admit to it, but she kind of liked him as well, was working on his masterpiece, as he called it. He started on the painting well enough, but Billy was getting upset with his work. It was supposed to be a mountain range, but because they were working with cheap watercolor, it looked more like someone had dropped brown vegetable soup on his paper. Jamie looked at him with a smile, walked over to him, and looked down at his artwork. She stared at it with a confused look. She turned her gaze back up to Billy with yet another smile, which made Billy smile in turn. They enjoyed each other's company here. Billy's family was non-existent, and he had been brought to the Haddonfield Children's Clinic from Salt Lake City, Utah, when he was just two years old. Billy had an unfortunate and heavy stutter, which prevented him from saying much of anything coherent. However, since he had laid eyes on her, Billy had always made brave attempts when talking with Jamie. It, 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 it l l looks like sh sh shit, Billy stuttered out looking at his artwork with disdain and embarrassment. Jamie shook her head and smiled at him again. She took a pencil and marked out where the mountain range should be on his artwork, helping Billy to redeem his piece. Billy, though, didn't understand what she was doing. Jamie wanted to tell him he should have mapped out his work lightly with a pencil before he put the paint on the page. It needed an outline, but that wasn't all. She wanted to tell him a lot of things, like how much she liked him, maybe even loved him, but she could not speak to him, not that she'd have the courage to tell him those private thoughts. She could handle everything she had been through, but confessing true love and expressing her feelings towards Billy? Well, it was this close to impossible. When one is as young as she, it can be easier to face down pure evil itself than it is to confess a crush. Jamie wanted to speak something fierce, but... Something inside her, the Nightmare Man, was holding back her voice. Billy took the initiative and thought about what Jamie had drawn out on the paper. He took his paintbrush and, as gracefully as he could, reformed the watercolors into an image that actually started to resemble the mountain range he had pictured in his head. All hope was not lost after all. Billy was so excited that he turned and smiled at Jamie with a vast, almost overzealous grin. Th -th -th Thank you, J J J Jamie. And with that, he gave her a brief but highly exciting, for both of them, side hug. God, did he want to be close to Jamie. Did he ever? This wasn't grown-up love, of course, but it was one of deep, honest care and understanding, which, after being abandoned at such a young age, was more than Billy had thought most adults were capable of. Jamie could have melted in that hug right then and there. In the depths of Jamie's subconscious, a searing, unbearable pain surged through her right temple, causing her to lose her equilibrium and nearly topple over. However, Billy's quick reflexes saved her from the imminent fall, though the sheer shock of the excruciating sensation left her utterly terrified. Without warning, the piercing pain struck again, threatening to induce a seizure similar to the previous episode she had in the recesses of the night. In response, Billy erupted into panic screams, pleading for help in a stuttering voice that struggled to escape his trembling lips. <laughs> help! Once more, the jolt of electricity coursed through her, but this time the pain inexplicably subsided, transforming into a strangely comforting lull, coaxing her towards a conscious slumber. Gradually, vivid visions infiltrated her mind. Flashes of golden leaves cascading from majestic sycamore trees mingled with fragmented images of her foster parents' home, flickering intermittently in her mind's eye. Jamie could hear Max barking with unrestrained panic. Through the hazy haze of her vision, she caught a glimpse of Rachel, drenched and wrapped in a towel, her presence tangible. Powerless to resist, Jamie's only recourse was to capture the elusive fragments of her vision on paper. As if trapped in a trance, reminiscent of the relentless zombies from Night of the Living Dead, 
she mechanically shuffled toward the adjacent drawing wall. With confusion laced with resolve, Jamie retrieved a set of black and red markers, the tolls of her revelation. Through her right eye, she witnessed Max's barking form, and with her markers, she depicted a gaping mouth filled with jagged teeth, its crimson maw shrieking in protective anger. The scene shifted, and Max lunged, sinking his teeth into the hand of a menacing figure. It must have been him, the Nightmare Man. It was. She knew it was. Jamie saw her uncle's hand descend, striking Max with brutal force, causing the poor creature to yelp and flee in fear. In a blink, the vision abruptly dissipated and Jamie found herself back in the realm of reality. Standing motionless, she fixed her gaze upon the drawing she had feverishly etched on the wall during her trance-like state, her mind racing to retain every fragment she had witnessed. As she gingerly retraced her steps, a sudden collision jolted her senses. Startled, she emitted an air-filled would-be scream and hastily turned around, only to find Dr. Loomis behind her. Gasping for breath, Jamie tried to steady her trembling body. Seizing Jamie's quivering shoulders, Sam, an extremely concerned presence beside her, implored with distress, "'What did you see?' Jamie mouthed the word at first and then tried with all of her might to utter some kind of sound that would make any sense. <laughs> Max! It wasn't just a whisper that time. Jamie screamed Max's name. Sam's eyes widened in shock. He immediately ran to the nearest telephone on the wall, put it to his ear, and dialed Rachel's home. He began to feel sweat creeping on his brow. His patience was running thin, and he was becoming increasingly anxious with every ring. He was frantic and terribly worried that he was too late to save Rachel. Finally, after the sixth ring, and just before the voice message machine picked up, Rachel picked up the phone. Dr. Loomis sighed briefly. Hello? Rachel asked, sounding out of breath. Rachel, this is Sam. Is Max all right? What? Again, out of breath. Is Max all right? Sam asked hurriedly. Dr. Loomis? No, well, I don't know. I can't find him anywhere. He's been barking at a cat or something since we got home. Dr. Loomis, I'm frightened, Rachel said. Well, go and check on him. Go on now. Anxiety gripped Jamie as she met Sam's gaze. A solitary tear welled up in her right eye, teetering on the brink of escape. Her mind swirled with worry and concern for Rachel. Each thought was laced with a sense of impending doom. However, in the tumultuous storm of emotions, a peculiar realization dawned upon her, and with it came an uncanny understanding of certainty. Jamie's worst nightmare had materialized before her very eyes, in her eyes. It was true. Her uncle had returned from the grave, defying all logical explanations. Somehow, some way, he had managed to claw his way out of that infernal pit of hell that the cops had consigned him to over a year ago. But what sent shivers down Jamie's spine was not the resurrection of her uncle alone. It was the turmoil within her mind that chilled her to the core. The visions that plagued her were intensifying, growing more vivid and disturbing with each passing moment. No longer mere episodes of disassociation or epileptic fits, she now understood them for what they were, genuine, tangible glimpses into her uncle's twisted perceptions. Astonishingly, Jamie had unwittingly become a conduit, granted the unsettling ability to peer through her uncle's eyes and witness the world as he saw it. The boundary between their minds had become blurred, leaving her to grapple with the repercussion of this newfound connection and the terrifying knowledge it bestowed upon her. Billy grabbed Jamie's right hand. He hoped that would help to calm her down. 
Jamie jumped a little, not expecting it, but appreciated the gesture, and gently squeezed his hand back. Rachel was back on the line. Dr. Lewis, Max isn't in the house. Sam looked around the room in an absolute state of fear and paranoia, and tried to grasp just what the hell he was supposed to do, but he knew this feeling well enough and controlled it. Rachel, listen to me very carefully, Sam began. You need to leave the house as quickly as possible. Right now! Drop the phone and go! Oh, Jesus, it's him, isn't it, Sam? It's Michael! Don't worry about it, just get out! Should I call the police? Rachel asked. No, Sam replied. I will call, but you need to leave the house immediately! Go on now! Rachel's breathing was erratic and dry, and her mind was ablaze in fear as she bolted out of the house, her bathrobe hastily wrapped around her trembling body. Panic surged through her veins, intensifying with each breath. It was a fear she thought she had left behind in the past year, but now it clawed at her with a raw intensity, like merciless shards of glass cutting into her brain. She quickly attempted to regain her composure, but in her current panic, finding solace seemed impossible. The realization that she was standing outside in broad daylight, still clad in her soaking wet bathrobe, gave her an intense sense of vulnerability. It wasn't merely a feeling of being physically exposed, but an emotional nakedness that exposed her to the world. The fear bore down on her, twisting her insides with dread. The protective armor she had constructed since the previous year's relentless attacks had vanished, leaving her feeling defenseless. Dr. Loomis's words echoed in her mind, declaring the house unsafe and amplifying her growing sense of freakish paranoia. And then there was Max, missing without a trace. Rachel's world began to feel like it was crumbling around her, as if the ground beneath her feet threatened to give way. The looming presence of Michael Myers lingered in her thoughts, a chilling reminder that her life could be extinguished in an instant by the slash of his blade. Visions flooded her mind, forcing her to confront the horrors of Halloween night, 1988. Sunday. The cherished family dog lay lifeless on the carpet, her body stiff with rigor mortis, her entrails torn out and partially devoured by some monstrous creature. The memory resurfaced, vivid and haunting, accompanied by the overwhelming sorrow of loss. Jamie, her foster sister, no, Rachel, your sister, your real sister, had narrowly escaped a similar fate, struggling desperately to survive. The scars of that harrowing night remained etched in Rachel's soul, and now she grappled with the unthinkable notion of reliving that nightmare. Was she going to have to go through that nightmare again? Rachel's body quivered, and her senses heightened to an almost unbearable degree. It wasn't just the chilling presence of Michael Myers that sent shivers down her spine. It was the sensation of countless pairs of eyes fixated upon her. As she stood there, clad only in her disheveled bathrobe, she felt the weight of the entire neighborhood's gaze upon her. The curtain-twitching fuckers peered through their windows, their curiosity piqued by the spectacle of the frantic woman loudly calling out for someone named Max. The feelings of fear and embarrassment combined to wreak havoc on Rachel's mental state. Rachel sat on the curb in front of her house, trying to calm down and wait for the police. It took ten minutes for the cops to arrive, and the waiting game was painstakingly long. To Rachel, it felt like an honest-to-fuck eternity as she sat on the curb waiting for them. Two of Haddonfield's finest police officers, deputies Nick Ross and Tom Farah, pulled up next to her, and the blue and red emergency lights and siren were so unnecessarily loud that Rachel had to put her hands to her ears. 
Would you turn that off? Jesus, Nick, the poor girl's going to go deaf. One of the officers yelled to the other one as they pulled up. The one who must have been Nick, a young buck, to say the least. He couldn't have been more than 21 years old. Clicked some dials on the dash control and the siren stopped. Miss Carruthers, Deputy Nick Ross said as he exited the passenger seat. Rachel got up, blood rushed to her head, and she almost lost her balance momentarily. She stabilized and was relieved that they showed up, even if one of them was someone who probably wasn't over a year or two older than she was. Yes, thank you both for coming. My dog is missing and I can't find him anywhere. Don't you worry, miss. We'll find him. Deputy Tom Farah exited the driver's side and slammed his door behind him. Tom Farah looked like someone that has been around for a while, seen a thing or two, and could do something. This made Rachel more comfortable and reassured. Deputy Farah came around and stood next to Deputy Ross on the sidewalk, both looking around the neighborhood. Deputy Farah looked like he spotted something. Black and brown, Doberman? To Rachel's astonishment, Max was running at full speed down the sidewalk, and drool was flying away from his mouth, his tongue flaying and his collar clinging. Rachel braced for impact, and Max jumped up, almost pulling down her bathrobe. Max started licking at her face, covering Rachel in thick dog slobber. Settle down, Max. It's so good to see you too, buddy. Rachel looked at the officers. Thank you so much for coming. Rachel stood up and held Max by the collar. Finally, some peace of mind. No problem, it's what we do, said Deputy Farah. Rescue cats, said Deputy Ross. Fine dogs, said Deputy Farah. That's our job, said Deputy Ross. Both deputies looked at each other, clearly recognizing they were being moronic, like something out of a bad sitcom. <clears throat> anyway, Miss Carruthers, I'm glad he's back with you. As for us, we better get going. Is there anything else we can help you with? Asked Deputy Farah. Rachel considered this for a moment. She did want someone with her right now. She felt better now that Max was home and next to her, but in reality, she was still scared. But she also didn't want to inconvenience the officers any longer. And after their little sitcom speech about finding dogs and rescuing cats, she didn't know if they were the ones she wanted around anyway. No... I think we're okay now. I sincerely appreciate you coming to help, said Rachel. Have a good day, miss, said Deputy Farah. The deputies got in their car and left. Later tonight, they would both be dead. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 2, and a little more than half of Chapter 3. I will finish Chapter 3 and do Chapter 4 in the next narration. Whew, losing my voice, but it was, wow, great chapters. Had a lot of fun narrating these two chapters. Um, first off, quickly, I'm going to say I enjoyed Jake taking us into Sam Loomis's head and getting to know a little more of what he thought of treating Michael for so many years. And not only that, but what other people really thought of Sam. I've always enjoyed the character of Sam Loomis, and the thing I really enjoyed about him in the novelizations so far uh, is how much backstory and stuff we got with him. So getting that from Jake now, I really appreciate that, and I can't wait to get some more. And uh, to know that he actually does care about Jamie and stuff, you know. I thought maybe he cared more about Michael, but in a way it's more like he's carrying that guilt that, uh, you know, that he's responsible for what Mike's doing almost, you know. By the way, kind of a, <laughs> a bad name for uh, Tina's boyfriend to be Mikey, but, you know, that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, 
I got to talk about the elephant in the room, but I'm going to I'm going to save it for the last here. I'm going to skip a certain part of what we narrated tonight, what you all heard, and I'll come back to that in a second with my thoughts. First, I want to say I thought that Jake did an amazing job not only getting us uh, you know, into the mind of Jamie and how scared she's feeling. And also, you know, you got to remember she's still a little girl, and he did a great job of that. Um, but the intensity and the anxiety in the scene of Rachel at home after, you know, Loomis calls, you know, that urgency from Loomis, what did you see, Jamie? You know, and then calling her, get out of the house. Um, I, I could really feel that urgency and anxiety so I really appreciated that writing. Um, God, I hope I'm not forgetting anything here, but uh, we will have a podcast episode on out-of-print slashers one day where we talk about this book, and maybe I'll go into more detail then. But Elephant in the Room, Michael Myers killed uh, apparently a 12-year-old kid, and boy, did he kill that kid. I mean, maybe that kid should have you know, learned that saying about you know, not throwing stones and everything bad dad joke probably there sorry but yeah you know Michael kind of getting mad that this kid was going after Jamie because he's like that's my kill uh, was pretty cool I did dig that you know I don't think Jason Voorhees is really the, a kid killer because I think he's still kind of a kid himself in his mind kind of like in part 6 he could have slaughtered all those kids that were sleeping in that cabin but he didn't but Michael Myers, on the other hand, yeah, in that one one of the, I can't remember what movie it was, but like a kid's down in front of him on the ground. Michael could have killed him. He didn't. Was it Halloween Kills, I think, in the flashback? But, you know, he did kill that kid in uh, Halloween 2018 with a rifle. So, yeah, I'm not shocked by the kill itself. But the brutality of it. Jake, if you're listening, I'm going to send some people to your house to ask some questions. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, very brutal death. Uh, Michael Myers at his best or worst. You know, just think of the brutality of that. Just trying, because I, I mow and stuff a lot. I mow mowing yard. When you pull that rip cord to start the mower, <clears throat> the blades are, are trying to spin while you're pulling it. So if you pull on it and you don't get it started, the blades still do like a half spin. So just think of that torture, you know. Not only that, but the kid's already got a broken arm, dislocated shoulder, probably thought he was invincible. You know, teenagers, preteens, nothing could ever happen to you, right? So just the fear and just the brutality of this kill and just knowing how mowers work and knowing that, you know, the first couple pulls on the string did some damage, but not as much as it was when the motor was fully going. Wow. Can you imagine seeing this kill on, you know, in a movie. Like one of the Halloween movies. I mean, come on, any type of slasher flick. So, kudos to Jake on that. I really feel like this kill, though, is going to divide the audience, just like it divided the boy. Sorry. Um, so, I'd like to hear from all of you what you thought of tonight's jam-packed episode, super, super-sized episode, Halloween special, uh, chapters 2, and most of Chapter 3 of Halloween 5 by Jake Martin. I want to hear what you what you think, Slashaholics. I'm really looking forward to the feedback on these chapters, especially that kill. And uh, I, I can't wait to discuss it with all of you. Uh, again, thank you, Jake, for writing this novelization. I know a lot of people wanted it. And I'm so happy that you're letting me narrate it. I hope everybody has a super fucking scary, terrifyingly horrific Halloween, but a safe one, and uh, I want to hear all about what you were all doing on Halloween. You know, if you want to drop down your Halloween plans in the comments section, um, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna take my kids out, do a little bit of trick-or-treating. They're kind of getting a little too old for it, but they still want to do it a little, and then we're going to go hit up some supposedly haunted areas. They want to go ghost hunting, uh, so that's our Halloween plans. What's yours? Um, thank you all so much for listening, as always. Seriously, Happy Halloween, you know, tis the season for this channel. Tis the season for Slashaholics. So until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying, thanks for listening, happy Halloween, 
Be excellent to each other, and remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. And was it the boogeyman? Yes, I believe it was. Good night, everybody. See you next time.